Um, I don't know who's going first. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Barbara. I will be going first. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Setting up my screen share. Can you see it? Yeah, that works. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, these are extraordinary times and uh, thanks to everyone for your interest and for attending. Um, so today I'll be setting up the stage for um, um, interest around bosonic codes. Um, I will be focusing on photonics as we go through the talk and uh, uh, I'll tell you about what's interesting and uh, the various unsolved questions we have. Um, so let me give you a brief outline. So I'll give you a brief introduction to bosonic codes um, and there'll be a particular focus on the Gottesman Kitai Preskill codes. I'll uh, give you a brief introduction to, its, uh, to the logical gates. And the track or the direction I want to go is to move towards uh, realistic state preparation and its implications. So the idea is to try to bring, uh, to go more from the theory towards the lab and how we push in that direction. And there are a lot of imperfections to look along the way and we will be talking about what tools we are developing uh, both on the theory and on the, on the simulation side to help us uh, tackle these problems. Okay, so uh, a brief primer to bosonic codes. So bosonic codes, they encode qubits into continuous variable systems. And CV systems, their Hilbert space is just the space of square integrable functions on, on the real line, depending on the number of modes that we have, it's, it's Rn. Um, so examples of bosonic codes, we just have heard a very good talk by Puri on cat states. Uh, we'll be focusing on GKP along with a couple other speakers in this workshop. Uh, both Menikuchi and Heinze will be talking about it. And I'm sure there will also be uh, other things considered along the way, such as dual rail or binomial qubits. And uh, rotation symmetry code was a, a recent work uh, from Grimsmo et al. It's a very nice work that connects uh, the cat states, the binomial qubits, and so on in a, in a generalized framework. So uh, these codes have been uh, garnering a lot of interest recently, uh, more towards their FT schemes and how we push towards that with more realistic uh, noise models. So in this talk, I'll be focusing on GKP states. And like I said, uh, I will be focusing on the photonic aspect of it. Um, so the GKP states, they, are, um, they have certain properties. Uh, they, are, they are stabilized states of very special position and momentum operators. I'll, I'll come to the details soon. Uh, in the ideal case, these are infinite energy states, and therefore one has to think deeper um, as we move towards uh, at the lab. Um, they naturally correct for small displacements. And another interesting aspect of the GKP code is that it's closely tied to the non-Gaussian resource theory. And I'll come to this point um, uh, like as we go along. Okay. So the, the, the ideal GKP code states, these are um, like in a, in a kind of a comb structure where the teeth are the Dirac delta functions, which are equally spaced along the real line. So for example, the, the zero code word, it has uh, these spikes at uh, regular intervals of two root pi. And, and similarly for the one state, which is displaced by another root pi. So they uh, take over like the odd bins or the odd positions. So what we notice is this wave function is translation in invariant with a period of two root pi. And these ideal states are infinite energy. They are not normalizable at this, in, in this current form. Um, this comb structure or like the, this, this kind of peak structure that we have, it has a natural robustness to small displacements. But of course, uh, for uh, other errors, one can uh, start building more uh, elaborate fault tolerance schemes, uh, concatenating with other codes and so on. Uh, these states are highly non-Gaussian states. And however, uh, recently there have been a couple of experiments, both from the superconducting platform and the ion trap platforms where they have generated the sort of normalizable or a finite energy version of these states uh, in the lab, which is very interesting and promising. So while my the talk focuses on the photonic aspect, uh, these uh, states and this general framework is relevant to all the platforms which consider bosonic encodings. Okay, so a brief intro to the, to the gates in this code. Um, 
The Pauli operations are just the displacements uh, along the P and X direction. Uh, the phase gate is, is a quadratic uh, Hamiltonian. It's what's known as a shear operation. Uh, the Hadamard is just the Fourier transform or the rotation gate. And the C0 is another uh, uh, Gauss spin on a quadratic Hamiltonian. And Pauli measurements are homodyne measurements. So up to this stage, we see an interesting sort of uh, connection between, so if you look at the Clifford operations on the left, they all correspond to Gaussian operations in the CD space. And from the photonic aspect, Gaussian operations are easier. And therefore, this, this uh, encoding already has a natural, um, like uh, naturally lead, lends to, to the CV implementation because the Clifford operations, which we would like to be easy, both from error correction and from many other aspects, they are actually easier to implement um, in the CV space. Of course, for universality, we also need to add uh, the PT gate, which can be done either through a magic state in, uh, injection or through a uh, Hamiltonian, which is uh, beyond quadratic, it's of order three. This is difficult in, in the photonics uh, platform, but, but we are aware about, about this. Okay, so like I mentioned, there are a few, few interesting facets we could look into that the Clifford operations map to fully Gaussian operations on the CD space, and the non-Clifford operations map to non-Gaussian operations. And uh, the Clifford operations uh, are easier for photonics, which gives some, some advantage to look at them a bit more closely. And there is also a recent result of uh, Menikuchi, which uh, reduced the non-Gaussian requirements of uh, doing universal quantum computation using the GKP code to just focusing on preparing the zero GKP. That's one approach they have. It's an interesting work that was recently published. And so there's, there's quite a bit of interest in this. Okay. So like I had mentioned, uh, our main focus is to try to move from the, this interesting theory that we have to push it towards the lab and like implementation. So uh, like I said, initially the, the GKP states, the ideal states are uh, infinite energy states. And uh, so therefore there are uh, different routes to look at their finite energy or normalizable versions. So the most prominent ones, I've just highlighted a couple of them here so the, the delta kappa approximation, what it does is that it replaces these Dirac delta spikes with Gaussians of a finite width, which correspond to squeeze states. And then there's a Gaussian envelope over the entire uh, state to make it normalizable. That's one approach. The other uh, common approach is what's known as the, the epsilon or the damping envelope. What they do is they apply a damping operator in the fog basis. I will show you this in the next slide in a bit more detail. And so now that we have some roots, so you could think of these as state preparation errors or, or some kind of errors, and we have to account for them in the computation. And depending on the route that we take to the, to the kind of finite energy states we want to work with, we have the corresponding error operators that we have to deal in the fault tolerance groups. And so one of the main questions which come up is what are the implications of finite energy states and how do you deal with it? And uh, so I had mentioned the two routes. This is just a bit more detail. The first one, the delta kappa approximation, like I mentioned, is just uh, a superposition of squeeze states, uh, which are uh, uh, set up along where the original delta peaks were. And then there's an overall Gaussian envelope. And uh, the second approximation or the second route to uh, a finite energy state is to apply a damping, exponential damping in the fog basis. Okay, so some natural or, or easy implications to, to observe are that if you work with finite energy states, uh, you're going to work, uh, these are going to become non-orthogonal and there are repercussions for error correction that you don't have perfect projectors back to the code space. You break the translational symmetry uh, that was there in the original GKP because these uh, uh, had, uh, they were translational symmetric along the real line and you break that symmetry, that would have some serious implications too. And so one example is that you just can't apply displacements arbitrarily because you would soon uh, uh, lead to uh, non like states which are not uh, high fidelity to the starting state. And there are other aspects uh, such as energy uh, dependence of the operators and so on that come into play in the compilation stage. 
Okay, so, so now that I've mentioned some of the implications that we are starting to see with finite energy states, uh, I just a, a short recap of, of uh, what we have is that, so the dynamics and the physics happens at the level of the CD space. And we want to track the information at the logical level. And the system is prone to leakage errors uh, because the original structure is, is very specialized. And therefore we need systematic ways to, to track this qubit information. Um, you would hear from uh, Menikuchi's talk on Thursday, uh, they had a, a, an approach which is known as the modular subsystem decomposition. Um, so you'll hear more from his talk. Just a brief comment is that that's one route to look at the information. What it does is that for any CV state, it gives you how to understand its logical information and tensor product with what they known as a gauge mode, which is something which is not, uh, which is outside the logical information. So there is a particular representation they work with, uh, which we have uh, looked and observed too. And this is one approach, uh, but there are other approaches one could look in conjunction, such as improved error correction techniques and um, you know, various other decoding strategies. Okay. So now that I have set up the stage for um, realistic uh, states, we would like to know how to prepare them. And like I said, uh, we'll be focusing on the photonics platform. So I'll give you a route to this problem, how we tackle this. So uh, we came up with this, um, with this sort of general scheme or, or a device, so, yeah, um, which is uh, very, very, so those who are familiar with uh, the GBS or the Gaussian boson sampling problem, uh, would be familiar with the circuit that I have over here. So uh, this device is a, is a universal state preparation device, which is conditional. So the, the output states are conditioned on a particular measurement outcome. So uh, I'll just go through some of the details. So this, here you have for every mode, uh, Z is, uh, represents the squeezing and alpha the displacement. So these are squeezed displaced states that are input to the modes. And so here I've shown an N mode example. And the U of theta is a, is a large interferometer or a, or, or a generalized beam splitter. It's a passive transformation and that, is, that can be easily broken down into beam splitters and phase shifters, which are easy optical components to work with. And so we have this squeeze displaced state entering this multi-mode interferometer. And what we do is that we measure all but one of the modes. So in this case, we measure modes two to n, and the first mode is what we want uh, as our target state. So few observations over here. We immediately see that the output state is necessarily non-Gaussian for non-trivial photon number detection. And the second is the output state depends on all these parameters in the circuit, namely the squeezing values, the displacements, the uh, angles of the beam splitters and the phase shifters are represented collectively as theta here and the photon number measurement outcomes. And using this method, we can actually target uh, any non-Gaussian state you want, but there are a lot of caveats uh, as we can expect. So one important thing from the experimental point of view is that uh, this device requires ultra low loss chips to implement this unit. Uh, the second aspect is that photon number detectors, they work in cryogenic conditions. Um, and the, the third is that the state preparation mechanism is inherently conditional or it, it's non-deterministic. Um, so yeah, but the, the, the advantage is that this device is universal. So we can fine tune the parameters of this, of this uh, circuit or this device to target uh, non-Gaussian states that you want. Okay, so uh, this, uh, that, that this can be done, it, uh, it uh, comes from a, a, a fact which is that um, every non-Gaussian state can be written in this particular form, which is known as a stellar representation. So I refer you to a recent paper by Chabot et al. Uh, they had a recent PRL which was published, which is a very nice, uh, uh, it goes through the nice details of what the stellar representation is. So what it says is that any non-Gaussian state can be broken down into Gaussian unitary applied to a Fox superposition. So uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of representation helps to, uh, for us to back work and design this, this device that we want in terms of this target parameters. And here now we just run through uh, a few numerical examples. So what we do is that we take the GKP state 
and look at its its finite energy version uh, which are what we call the 10 dB squeeze states and what we do is that for various levels of approximation so this for cutoff here is the cutoff we use in the stellar representation and for more and more numerical accuracy you need to go deeper into the Fox space and so for various values of this cutoff uh, so for, for here I've uh, shown you 4, 8 and 12 uh, we can go back work what this device should be and we try to simulate uh, this, this outcome. So note that I have mentioned that it's lossless. So we haven't added uh, other imperfections that come from an experimental point of view. Uh, but this is just as a proof of principle of this, of this method. So, um, so using different sizes of the device, so it could be a three mode or a four mode uh, device and so on you can see that uh, we can in principle achieve very high fidelities. And the rough probabilities that we are dealing with is ranging between 0.1 to 2%. And these are the detector patterns for the modes which are being measured. So the way you read this example is that uh, to, to generate a state with a high fidelity, a finite energy GKP state to a high fidelity uh, with using four photons as, as the cutoff here, that you can generate with 2% probability and two of the modes are detected in two and three. So you preset and you, you selectively choose that particular outcome. And this is the reason why the device is conditional. And well, that's not a necessarily immediate problem. What we do is that you can think of ways to multiplex and increase this probability from the, the value we have for one device to, to sort of the required probability uh, for whatever schemes you are working with uh, through state preparation funds. And in this example, uh, we set a, uh, a squeezing cap to the input squeeze state at 12 dB. Um, just, uh, if not, can I ask a quick question? How this, uh, this cutoff that you're using here is influencing the, the delta of the GKP states because you were referring that. So what's the, the relation exactly? So, so what we do is that we fix the delta. It's, it's roughly corresponding to 10 dB GKP states. What we do is that this would give you the way you approximate that state. So numerically, we try to write down that state. Okay. With the maximum fidelity, we break it down into this representation and then target that state using this device. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so you, like, ideally, you would like to have as much in the fork uh, cutoff that would be closer to the 10 dB states. So these are all approximations to the same GKP state. Um, yeah, one example to look at, I, I'll just show you this, this kind of uh, the, the way to look at it, maybe pictorially it, would, it could uh, help bring out this fact a bit better. So here uh, we look at the 10 dB squeeze state, which is a particular uh, GKP state. And as you see, it does have some of the peak structure, but it has the Gaussian envelope and each of these peaks has slightly broadened, okay? And if we use this different levels of the, the cutoff value, like at four, eight or 12, you can see you start approaching that peak structure closer. And so these are the states which are being output from the device. And so this, you can use this to find out what are the resource requirements in the sense, how much physical squeezing do I need? Uh, what should be my uh, detection uh, levels or uh, uh, what levels should they work at? and uh, what should be the beam splitter values and so on. And what is the fidelity of this output state to your target state? And so these are all uh, various aspects. And it is a multi-parameter problem. So there is a lot of trade-off you could have. Do you want higher fidelity? Do you want higher uh, probability? Do you want better peak structure? So the cost function is, is rather complicated and we could, we could fine tune for different aspects of it. And uh, one of the, the implications I had mentioned, like when you start working with finite energy states, uh, there are many things that come into play, like non-orthogonality of the code words and so on. Here is a simple depiction uh, of, you, if you take this, this, uh, this finite energy state and you just displace it across the, the x-axis, let's say by an application of, of Pauli to the four, you already see that the, the final state, which is in red and the blue state are fairly uh, with low fidelity, even though we know that that's the Pauli operator should give you uh, the identity. So there is a fix for this particular example. We can choose to apply displacements in two different directions, the forward and the back direction. Uh, however, in general, the, the problem is, is complex and we'll have to see how do you uh, put in uh, finite energy states with a general computation. 
And uh, so we have seen some aspects of, of uh, the state preparation and you see the, the details that are involved and, and the various uh, intricacies in this. But as I mentioned, this was just a simulation with in the lossless case. However, there are many, many uh, imperfections to look into the system. So for example, uh, you could have these speed states being noisy, uh, either thermal noise or they could have multiple Schmidt modes. Uh, the detectors have inefficiencies. There is loss in the waveguides uh, or in the, in the, um, in the chip. Uh, we could have coupling and switch losses for various optical components which are connecting to it. Uh, there are imperfections in the, in the gate. Uh, another thing is uh, inline squeezing, which is not relevant to this particular uh, device, but in general, if you needed to do the, the P gate, you need inline squeezing, which is fairly noisy in the photonic setting. And of course, this loss affects various aspects of state preparation and it would permeate through the computation. And therefore, we see that, uh, that like the moment we start stepping into the realistic setting, we are open with sort of into a plethora of problems. Not only were there various device imperfections that we have to deal with, uh, it starts right off at the state preparation level itself. And so uh, looking, taking this route and pushing it a step further, so we are now moving into developing toolboxes. So the case for simulators. So you would have heard a lot about uh, simulators in, in the qubit sense, uh, but there are very little uh, uh, known about the CV systems. Um, in Zanero, we do have a strawberry fields, which is one CV simulator, but we would need something a bit more tailored to bosonic codes. And the reason CV systems are hard to simulate because you would have a certain fork cutoff, say for each mode, and this scales fast with the uh, length. So if you have a few modes, you already deal with a big system. And so you need to have uh, clever and interesting ways to simulate your physical system. And the other aspect I just mentioned, few or a, a small set of the imperf imperfections one has to deal with. And these are extremely crucial for, for default tolerance schemes uh, that we also heard uh, uh, Shruti mention in her talk. So we see that uh, we'd like to understand the noise, its role, the, the, the interplay between the various noise models and so on. And all these would help us better estimate what are the realistic resources required uh, in the hardware side, for example, what should be the multiplexing size to hit a particular probability? What is this, the GKP state, the finite energy version we can work with so that we have a fault tolerance scheme given these noise models and so on and so forth. And like what is a good fidelity probability sweet spot to target for state preparation and various other ways to model noise in the different components of the device. So uh, at this stage, uh, I will be stopping and pa uh, passing it over to my colleague who will tell you a bit more about these different tools that we are developing. Okay, thank you, Krishna. Um, so um, now, uh, Guillaume will share a screen, I presume. We won't have questions at this point. We'll just move to the end of the talk, I think. Yes. Just at the end. Okay, there you go. All right, you see my screen? Now I see you, not the screen yet. Uh. Oh, sorry. I just have to share. <laughs> Can you see? No? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, zoom us. What's happening? It looks like we lost him. Yeah, I think he's probably uh, getting off and on or something. Yeah, let's wait a bit. Did he test his screen share in the beginning? I'm not sure. He was the only one who didn't test. Uh, <laughs> who are the organizers of this conference? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's for me, a guy. Yeah. Everybody's waiting. We're already running late. We could, we could the chair is really maybe. Talk too long. We could, we could take a question, maybe. Yeah, are there any questions?
I did not fully understand this role of this n max really because you know you said oh any state can be written as uh, this superposition of fox states and a Gaussian. Now, of course, if I let this n max become very large, I don't need that Gaussian because any state can be written, you know, as a superposition of this these fox states. Um, so that that's true. The the reason you want to factor out this Gaussian component is so that it helps to understand what's the core non-Gaussian value. So what I mean by that is this this device that I put out, any Gaussian operator that you can factor out can be retransformed into a new squeezing set of values entering another interferometer. I see. Okay. And so you can just target a much smaller state, which helps you rather than targeting because all these Gaussian operators could still spread your Fox state all the way to infinity because it has squeezing and so on. But when you factor this out, it helps you to work with a much smaller Fox superposition. And okay. what you do with that extra thing is you kind of fold it into the interferometer and the input squeezing values. Yeah, that's the reason we look at this particular mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so we have Guillaume one uh, Q&A, sorry. So oh, Guillaume just mentioned his back, so. Okay, there's a question here. Why do you focus on preparing GPKP, G, the GKP zero state the use of a GKP magic state and then zero can reduce cost in implementing universal quantum computation using, and then there's a paper. Um, but I think this relates to this mini Kuchi result, right? Maybe this is, um, this is maybe not optimal, but if you can do, okay, cost reduced all Gaussian universality. Sorry, I'm just sort of talking to myself. Okay, yeah, so the question I, I, is, why I, do you focus on preparing a GKP zero? Sure, I, I can just mention that that's just one way to look at it. Suppose someone had a constraint that I just want the most minimum resources to target. It's true that the zero GKP is enough, but that's not particularly a constraint we are looking at because the device for us, it can produce any, uh, any uh, state on the block sphere with kind of equal uh, difficulty. All you have to do is take your, your, your favorite GKP state you want you, re, you break it down into the, the stellar representation and you can produce it. Right. And so yeah. for us, that's not a particular constraint. This is more like optimization. Yeah. Suppose you tell, or we come up with a scheme which says we need three or four states, then we can do that too. Yeah. Okay. I think there is another question by Steve Gerben, but maybe we'll leave that for the, for the end. And then we, can, we have to move forward. So I see a screen uh, by Guillaume now. Yes, right? it is me. Can you hear me? Okay. So yeah, it's working out. let's keep on. My mic is on. Okay. Sorry okay. for the technical problems. Right, so <clears throat> so on this talk on, on this part I want to focus or talk a bit about um, well simulator to try to understand what exactly noise models, you know, all these finite energy effect and imperfection negates and to, to understand a bit better to try to map them um, and to understand when we concatenate with qubit codes, when we try to, you know, embed this, this GKP perform error correction at, uh, the, the, at either the GKP states or on the concanted codes on the, with which it will be used. So to understand these effect, you know, of the noise and to be able to um, evaluate values like thresholds, uh, how much squeezing can we, in, in this experimental space, right? And how much squeezing we can tolerate, how much loss is, is tolerable, sorry. Um, so clearly a full microscopic description is not going to be scaling very well. <laughs> um, so the idea is to develop tools that are uh, focused a bit more about the specific structure of the GKPs that will allow to look at small step steps and the way that, you know, we will implement uh, logical, you know, gates on these GKP specific for this, this R photonics uh, architectures. And then to try to figure out um, from then what are the actual uh, parameters um, that that affect the system, so so that we can then extract the you know uh, models which will allow us to to understand better the larger scales. All right, and ultimately, really, we we really want to map specific hardware to uh, as um, uh, <clears throat> characteristics to uh, do some informed decisions about well what kind of like, how do we implement the logical gates and what will minimize the overall uh, overhead that will require to perform some fault runs error correction. This kind of platform, right? And so for the GKPs, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail of the Wigner function because Shruti already talked about it, but um, 
it turns out to be very nice uh, way to study these GKPs and this and this Wigner function. So, for example, this is just a Wigner function that uh, one of the state Krishna is mentioning about that think of the logical zero with a delta of delta db. Right. So we have a sum of of of, of of these peaks in phase space that think of the logical information. And it turns out that for realistic GKPs, so this, this is a very nice description in, in a set of a discrete sets of, of Gaussian, uh, some of Gaussian probability distribution function in these Wigner picture. So it's not necessarily, you know, these are not necessarily physical states, but the Wigner function is well represented as, as this linear superposition. So here I've separated the terms in positive and negative terms for this CI, so the CI coefficients, um, which really are the, the, the guys who tell you about the, what encoded information is in the, in the qubit. So here I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm talking about the square GKPs, but it will work the same, except the coefficient would be different in the hexagon uh, GKPs, right? Hexagonal, sorry. Um, and these Gaussians are characterized by both a mean, so these are the position of the peaks that you would see right, and some uh, covariance matrix. So if this was the ideal case, so all these would be actually delta functions over in, uh, in space, and the means would be exactly at, uh, for if it's squared value on the square root of pi values on the lattice. Uh, but in the realistic case, uh, these means are slightly different. Uh, they're actually closer to the origin, and of course they have some Fat values about them. So they're not actually data functions, but they have some spread in phase space. Um, right. Uh, okay, so, and the way, uh, so writing the Wigner function in that way turns out to be very useful for, for us uh, because a lot of the actual operations are Gaussian in our settings. So as, mentioned, as, as, as Krishna mentioned, they are the easy operations that we can perform once you have the non-Gaussian entity that comes from the, the PNR measurements. And it's easy to keep track in this set them in this linear superposition of Gaussians, how these states evolve, right? Um, so the Gaussian operations, so essentially applying logical in the Clifford groups, all the compose all fall under this setting, um, is simply modifying the means and covariance matrices by applying some, some symplectic matrix that correspond to the actual uh, optical components that is used to apply the gate, beam, beam splitters, space shifters, all these sort of things, and some displacement potentially. And the, the same thing for the covariance matrix, right, to this relation. Uh, loss is also a very nicely fitting if it's in this, this formalism, uh, because it's, again, easy to keep track of the states by looking at how these uh, means and covariance matrices transform uh, on under loss with this theta, which is giving you the parameter about you know how, how how much loss you are possessing. And yo, maybe I missed something. Yep. Well, sorry, the G that you had in this ghost one slide back. Yes. Uh, that's uh, okay. This right. G is the way is the Wigner function of a GKP state with a certain amount of squeezing. Is that right? Is that what you're saying or not? No, so these here are Gaussian probabilities the distribution. Oh, so they're not the very, so like the, 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 yeah, so the W is the Wigner function of the GKP state. So okay, for this reason, yeah. yeah. So these are, uh, I mean, they're normalized and, and, this and they're parameterized by these two signs, right? Um, and you also also uh, measurements are important. So modern measurements are used for, for example, doing error corrections. They are also can be used for applying implement, implementing some of the gates. And in this case, uh, the keeping track of how the Wigner function transforms after a measurement, uh, if the measurement is Gaussian, so that again include homodines, is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so the means and covariance matrix transforms in a, a simple way, which is uh, dependent on the measurement outcomes, and of course you you know you di diminish the dimensionality of your systems, but these can be ke kept track pretty simply. Um, so this formalism allows us to not only simulate these things um, at, at a reduced cost, for example, than just looking at if you were having the full uh, photon uh, Fox space description, 
But also I think it's useful to gain a bit of intuition because it's really, you can keep track of these Gaussian mean and covariance as the noises affect our processes uh, happens. And so as an example, uh, here I'm just showing about the application of a P gate, which uh, Christian mentioned. So in this case, we're gonna be um, using, so this P gates can be this, uh, decomposed into some rotations, so essentially some phase shifters. And uh, S here is some squeezing operator. So, and to implement the squeezing, uh, one of the way to do it in our kind of settings is to do some measurement-based squeezing. And the way it works is that um, essentially, if you have your input state, your GKP, so the state that is, uh, you know, uh, expelled or produced by the the circuit, the kind of circuit that Krishna mentioned, um, so you can prepare a squeeze state S here, which is a current state. So interact them through a beam splitters and some of some transmittivity, which is given by the actual amount of squeezing that you want to perform. So of course. Uh, for the piece squeeze, there's a specific amount. I forgot exactly what the number is. And then performing, this is some homodyne measurements, which is performed, so again, at Gaussian operations. And some, finally, based on the homodyne outcome that you measured for your ancilla mode that you, uh, for, for your, from your initially squeezed states, uh, then you do some conditional displacements. Again, here, this is a, a way to, uh, implement displacement in a measurement base, right? So this is just a simple examples, but really if you want to implement a, a code or encoding into a surface code, say, or, or some more uh, complicated stabilizer code. So you would have really the circuits to start from their state that are created by the GBS. Uh, you would have the me measurement syndromes, you know, decompose into such optical elements. And just to give a bit of, uh, show a bit what you can see. So this is just a single GKP. So this is, of course, we can simulate more than that, but a single is easier uh, just for representing because you can just look at the variant function in 2D and in phase space. And so this is, if I were to apply a P gate, so this is a pretty good start uh, GKP that was produced for 20 dB. So this is more than what Krishna was, was mentioning, uh, but we can take that say as a perfect or quasi perfect states or ideal. Um, and so this is applying the P gate, essentially the P gate in phase space, uh, it leaves the Q quadrature unchanged, but the P, it just adds the P plus Q quadrature. So in this case, uh, I started from a plus GKP encoded or zero with a rotation after that, the P gates. And uh, what you measure is that it's an eigenstate of the Y operator. So measuring the Y operator would be uh, essentially measuring and performing a normal line measurement in the P plus Q quadrature. So this 45 degree angles. Um, so this would be if I were just applying directly this uh, transformation. Now, if I apply the measurement based version, so this, I don't have any loss. All I have as an error is that my, the squeeze states that I use for measurement and displacement are not infinitely squeezed, right? They have some, uh, some finite value. Right, and when I apply all these gates and the circuit that I showed in the previous slides, really what you get is in phase space, it looks like, um, I mean, this obviously it's a bit more noisy than the noise between the, the, the Gaussian state from the, the squeeze states and the GKPs are, are kind of combining. And if you start having a 1% loss in between every optical element I, that I had in here, so really you can see that the changes are affected by quite a lot. So this is just really what is happening in the, in the, the in the Wigner phase space, but that careful analysis of how is my component, how they, these, these transformations combine in a way that we can kind of map it to either Pauli models or qubit channels um, to then do some large scale simulation. Uh, I mean, this is under progress to understanding all these features. There's a lot of, uh, of complexity and just basically understanding where the logical information is or you know, how to interpret the measurement outcome you can have when you have inefficiencies in the detector and other, other, other aspects that, uh, complicate things. Um, so this was just some simple uh, simulation just to try to, to show a bit how, how, how this works and also, uh, I'm sorry. <coughs> right, and um, so, so far I've shown you only uh, Gaussian operations that were used for gates, but um, uh, there's very good reasons to, to, to 
to think that the PNRs themselves, which are non-Gaussian, which are the non-Gaussian source for creating these GKPs, can be described as well in this, in this, this uh, formalism as, you know, as some of a linear combination of Gaussian terms for a Fox state of n, it would have n plus one uh, term. So we have pretty good evidence of that. We're just looking at some less, like, uh, less the, you know, details to convince ourselves very clearly. And then, of course, we can use this to this this uh, these simulations to understand better what happens in a more realistic setting, or at least settings which are closer to our experimental uh, hardware capabilities. Um, how you know what would be the performance of doing GKP error correction of single mode, uh, or of course more interesting uh, or, or equally interesting concurrent thing with other codes, and to really have a better idea of how the actual performance of the basic hardware components will affect the, the, the threshold value and the performance of the logical operators, uh, logical information. So really, this is a lot of, uh, lots of work to be done. So this is our complex topics and understanding um, approximations based on these, you know, um, more heavy simulations to go forward in a way that keeps track of the most limiting factor fundamental will be, uh, you know, very useful in actually um, really understanding the performances of the hardware. Uh, yep. Is there any questions? <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. thanks, Guillaume and uh, Krishna for the two nice talks. Sorry, I was I was listening, but I thought you still had to wanted to say something else. Um, let me now first. Actually, there was Steve Gerben had to leave, but he asked a question to Krishna. Uh, what's the fidelity of your protocol for GKP preparation? I could not connect the numbers you showed to the graphs of the wave function, which seemed to suggest the fidelity was low. Um, that is, I think. Um, maybe Krishna, you can say something about that. Yeah, sure. So what I can say is that, like, um, you can in principle target very high fidelities. So you just have to take a larger fork cutoff, which I had mentioned, and you can actually produce that states to very high fidelity. The downside is that you would require a larger GBS device, and the probability of producing that state would go down. And therefore, it's it's a, it's a difficult problem to know what it is that you really want to target. Is it very high fidelities or probability, or there's a, there's a trade-off that you want to target in between? And what about the states which are produced around it? By around, I mean like with uh, measurement values in the neighborhood. So these are all points that one have to look and try to map those CV states which are produced for the device better to the logical information. Okay, thanks, Krishna. Um, are there other questions? I'm looking at the Slack channel. I see this is good. Um, one thing I have a question about Guillaume's talk about uh, you flash this measurement and of course homodyne measurements is easily done but you are also including the photon number measurements there this in the update of this uh, Victor function yeah this is a progress but yeah we think we can include in this formalism of course it's going to be non-Gaussian but it will be uh, nicely fitting in time in in the so formalism and sums of this type of simulation of like, writing the Wigner function in this this two, you know, positive and a negative part is sort of a, a, a most efficient way of proceeding. Is that right? Uh, so I wasn't completely following this. Yeah. So it's 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 in order to be more efficient than, um, you know, just the write it down in the Fox space directly, and it's also gained some intuition a bit about how things evolve from the analytics. But it's more tailored to the specific form of the of the you know, of the states we're dealing with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the motivation for the PNR, the PNR is, is really uh, the way that these states are generated. So to include this in this formalism to really, you know, understand better the effect of noise that, that, you know, not just that once we have the state generated, but also once the states are, you know, what, at the preparation stage. Right. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, anyhow, uh, Krishna and Guillaume can also look at the Slack channel. People can post questions there. And we move to the next talk. Uh, we thank uh, Krishna and Guillaume again. And then we move to the last talk uh, by...